Helen Keller is probably one of the most well-known and one of the best examples of a person overcoming a disability. Helen was born in 1880, both deaf and blind, which meant that she spent a significant chunk of her childhood years in a form of isolation in many ways. Because it wasn't until a woman named Annie Sullivan came along somewhat well, further along in, in Helen's childhood and, and taught her how to read and write and communicate by tracing letters on her hands that Helen was able to kind of break out of that isolation and start to converse with the world around her. And yet despite her somewhat late development socially, Helen would go on to become a lecturer and an author and a political advocate and would really just lead this amazing life. It's just really, really an inspiring story if you're not familiar with it. However, if Helen had been born in the biblical time period in the first century, her story would have been impossible. Many people that were born with, with disabilities just didn't excel in that world. You and I, that, that might be hard to believe because we're used to seeing people born with disabilities excel and thrive, where we're used to seeing amputees compete in competitions and excel and, and win. We're, we're used to seeing people with visual or hearing impairments live lives that are relatively unhindered. For us, that's normal. But in this ancient world, that just wasn't the case. Most people born with disabilities lived sad lives on street corners begging for food or for money. And it wasn't because people were cruel. It's just that there was a mindset and social structures that we're used to today that, that hadn't shifted or been established yet in that ancient world. It was just a very different place. And really, a, a body that was healthy and and whose faculties and whose members functioned optimally made all the difference in the world between life and misery. And that's probably why the body is used as such an extensive metaphor in Scripture for the church. We started a series last week called Stop Going to Church. And in that message last week, we said the church is not a destination. It's not a place we go. It's not an event we attend or an activity that we do. Rather, the church is you, the people of God. If you missed last week's message, that's basically it in a nutshell. But that's where we left it too, and there's kind of a lot of unanswered questions just hanging in the air, like what, what does it mean for us as the people to be the church? What does that look like in practice? And, and why do we bother gathering together if, if church is not a destination, if it's not a thing we do? And today we're going to begin answering some of those questions as we start looking at metaphors and pictures that God has given us of the church in Scripture that, that help us understand who we are as the church and what it means to be the church. And today we're going to look at the metaphor of the body. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a passage from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open those up in the book of 1 Corinthians to follow along. As always, if you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along on the screens to the side. Or if you have the opportunity... Download the FCC Monmouth app on your mobile device. Just click the Sunday button on the navigation bar, and you'll find sermon notes with our passage this morning already pulled up, broken down for us to take notes on and digest. So let's just get into it. 1 Corinthians. This is a book that, that needs some context in order to understand. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, somebody commissioned by Jesus to go spread the gospel into the ancient world. And it's a letter written to a church in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a, was a Greek city. It was a port city. There were a lot of different ideas and, and moralities and things that mixed together. And so it was kind of a Wild West situation in some ways. And the church in Corinth is supposed to be a light for the gospel in the community. But really, if you ever want to ruin a church completely, just read the book of 1 Corinthians and do everything that those people were doing. Because it was a mess. They've got people that were fighting and dividing and splitting the church over which preacher they like better. They had people that were suing one another, taking one another to court. They had some people that are doing weird sex stuff that even people on the outside culture that was known for its promiscuity was looking at and going, that, that ain't right, guys. And yet people in the church were patting them on the back. Like, it was a messy situation. And when we get to chapter 12, we find yet another issue along which this church is fighting and bickering and tearing itself apart. It's an issue of spiritual gifts. Now, I might be saying, some of you may be familiar with that term, some of you may not. What is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is an ability, it's a, a talent, it's something that we do, a, 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 something that we excel at, rather, that every Christian possesses, that the Holy Spirit uses for the purpose of building up the church. Not a building, but us, the people. And that may sound kind of mystical in some ways, but we're not talking about like superpowers or anything like that. I wish I had the spiritual gift of laser vision. 
I really, really do, but that's just not a thing. That's not how it works. It's these, these are just kind of normal things. For example, one of my spiritual gifts is the ability to preach, to look at God's Word and to draw a message out of it and to share it with God's people as something that has just always come pretty easy to me. And if you're being honest with me, I do okay at it. That's just something that I do. That's how God put me together, and that's my role in the church. Now, there are a lot of spiritual gifts I do not possess. For example, the gift of encouragement. I can encourage people, and I often do encourage people, but I'm going to be honest with you for a minute. It does not come naturally to me. I struggle with it. It's not the first thing that comes to my mind. I oftentimes feel like I'm saying the wrong words. I fumble over my words. And emotionally, I feel kind of depleted afterwards because it's just not the normal way I'm put together. But some people, and you've probably met these people before, they just ooze encouragement. They're like the most encouraging people you've ever met. They know exactly what to say and how to say it and when to say it. And more importantly, they love encouraging people. It's just who they are. They have the gift of encouragement. And you can probably start to tell just from these two examples here that these, these gifts are things that are meant to unify us in the church because we don't all possess all of the gifts available. I'm good at some things, you're good at some things, but together, as a church, we can be good at everything. This is supposed to unify us, but that's not happening in the church of Corinth. In fact, they're fighting over spiritual gifts, and if something that's meant to build us up and unify us is actually becoming a source of division and this cancerous erosion of our fellowship, we have a really big problem on our hands. And this is what it looked like in Corinth. There, were, there would be this spiritual gift. For them, it was the gift of tongues, speaking in tongues, however we want to interpret that. And those that had this gift were seen as more spiritual or as more mature or more developed. And those that did not have this particular gift were seen as kind of second-tier, second-class believers. To, to understand that a little bit, let's say this side of the room, this section, we have the gift of teaching. We just know how to teach the Bible for all that it's worth. And you guys over here, this side, you don't have the gift of teaching. You are good at a lot of other stuff, but that's just not how God's equipped you. And let's say that as teachers, we look at those guys and we go, what's wrong with them? They're, they must not be reading the Bible enough. They must not be praying enough. There's something wrong with them. They're doing something wrong because they're just, they're not able to teach like us. I wish, I wish they could just grow up. And you guys in the middle, jury's still out if Jesus loves you or not, depending on how you could teach or not. No, it's just, now is this how spiritual gifts are supposed to be? No. Not at all, because that tears a church apart. Instead, these are supposed to be things that bind us together. And, and, and so Paul writes this letter as a way of bringing about unity in this church and talking about this idea of the church as a body. Now, some of us may be saying, okay, this is, this is all fine and well, but what does that have to do with us? Because we are not a church divided. We're not fighting over spiritual gifts. Some of us didn't even know what spiritual gifts were until like five minutes ago. So where is this going? And here's the message, okay? Spiritual gifts are kind of the vehicle that Paul uses to get to this message. But the message that he really wants us to walk away with, that we're going to talk about this morning, is something that applies to every church, in every situation, at every time in history. It is a universal truth that we start to understand when we see the church as a body, okay? And as a body, the church has many parts, many people. But all of them have a place of belonging in the body. We all belong together. Let's look at how he expresses this. Chapter 12, verse 12. He says, Just as a body, the one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body's not made up of one part, but of many. So he goes back and forth. He says, we're one, but we're many, but we're one. Basically, what he's saying here is that the church is made up of all kinds of different people. And he lists some of them in their context here in verse 13. He says, we got Jews, we got Gentiles, we got slave, we got free, people of different ethnic backgrounds, people of different socioeconomic backgrounds, different strata in society. We got all kinds of people in the church, and that's true of us too here at FCC. We got all kinds of different people. Got rich folk, poor folk, employers, employees. We've got young families. We've got senior citizens. We've got a mix of all kinds of different people and different life situations, different backgrounds, different stories. We've also got a lot of different opinions in our church. Imagine that, a church filled with opinions. Who would have thought? No, we do. We have a lot of opinions about a lot of things. 
For example, uh, opinions on, on how Christians should live their faith out in, in the real world. Should Christians watch an R-rated movie? We're going to have different opinions about that. Should, uh, should Christians focus more on tried and true hymns, or should we express ourselves through contemporary Christian worship? We're going to have different opinions on that. Should the sermon be 20 minutes, or should it be 45 minutes? I have an opinion on that. You probably do, too. We may or may not agree. Should the, the teaching and the sermons be topical, or should they be what we call expository, preaching through a book? We're going to have opinions on that. Even beyond that, we're going to have opinions on, on, on things like how the church is run, how it's organized, how it's structured, how funds are spent. We're going to have all kinds of different opinions in the church about all kinds of different things, because there's a lot of different people here. Even beyond this, if we want to get more specific, we've got a lot of different kinds of gifts and talents represented in our church body. We've got people who teach. We've got people with musical ability. We've got some people that love working with children. We've got some people that have a heart for teenagers. We have some people who, who have what we might call a gift of mercy, whose heart just goes out for the sick and for the homebound. We've got some who, who just have this ability to just jump in and serve and do whatever needs to be done, no matter how tedious or meaningful it may be. They just love service, what we might call a gift of service. We've got all kinds of different gifts represented here in this church, all kinds of different people. But here's the thing. As diverse as we may be, every single one of us has a place of belonging here. We fit together like a body. And that idea gets expressed as we keep reading. Look at verse 15. He says, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Now I want to kind of illustrate what's being said here in kind of a fun way. This is probably not exactly what Paul had in mind, but it's not too far off either. I'd like everybody, if you can, just, just make a fist, kind of hold it out in front of your face like this. I'm, I'm gonna, I, there's a few people here this morning because of snow, so I can see you all. Let's all do this. We're going to hold it here. And if you kind of notice that line where your thumb lays across your knuckle, it kind of it looks like a mouth if you wiggle that thumb a little bit. You can imagine some googly eyes there if you need to. And so well, just, just practice that. Get your little hand puppet going. He's talking to you a little bit. Have some fun. Now, I want you, with your little hand puppet that you've just discovered, in the saddest, most pathetic voice you can, I want you to say this. I don't belong. You can just do that. I don't belong. Go ahead. You're having very quiet conversations, I can tell. You all look like a bunch of crazy people, by the way, talking to your hands this morning. That's, that's just funny. I know I asked you to do it. But here's the thing. How ridiculous is it to think that your hand, or any part of your body for that matter, would express discontent with belonging to you? That's your hand. It has always been your hand. It will always be your hand. It is part of your body. It may not be a foot. It may not be an eyeball. It may not be the biggest hand in the world. It may not be the most agile hand in the world. But you know what? It's your hand, and it belongs to you. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here is, look, you belong in the body. You may not look like any of the other people around you. Your life may have a different story or a different background than all the people sitting around you. You may have a different opinion on things, a different perspective on life because of how you've been shaped or raised or the experience that you've had. You may have different views on a particular theological issue. You may have a different idea of, of maybe how a church should be run or how your gifts can be expressed. You may have just a, a lot of differences about you, but here's the thing. Don't think that just because you don't 100% look identical to all the people sitting around you that you don't belong in this body. Because I got news for you. There is no church on the face of the earth that you will 100% fit in and look identical to everybody else because the church is diverse. Every church in every place in every corner of the earth is made up of all kinds of different people and that's the way God designed it. He doesn't want us all to look the same. He doesn't want us all to have the same life experience. He doesn't want us all to have the same perspective or same personality or same views. He doesn't want us all to have the same abilities and talents and gifts. He wants his body to be diverse, to be many parts, and they all belong together. You belong here. But more than that, our diversity isn't just about expressing God's desire. It is essential to the function of God's church. 
You see, the body has a lot of parts. So does the church. And like the body, all those different parts of people in the church have a specific and essential function. And we read that as we keep looking at what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians. Verse 17, he says, If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, you included, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but there's one body. My dad, at his house, he has this Mr. Potato Head that he keeps for the grandkids to play with whenever they come over. And my three-year-old, Levi, every time we go there, he wants to get the Mr. Potato Head out, and he puts all the pieces in, and he does a pretty good job of putting them where they're supposed to go. I prefer to have a little bit more of an artistic flair when I play with Mr. Potato Head. Sometimes I'll put four arms on the potato. Sometimes I'll put noses where the ears are supposed to be, or I'll take the feet and I'll just shove it right where the eye socket is, and they'll just have a big feet face. And every time I do it, my son, he goes, Dad, that's silly. Because even a three-year-old knows that the body is supposed to have certain parts so that it can function the right way. Can you imagine a church that did not have eyes? And which, by that I mean a church that could not see out of its front doors into the community and into the world that it's placed to see the needs and to see the problems and see the opportunity set before it. How functional do you think that church would be in its mission if it couldn't see? Or imagine a church that has a mouth, but it has no hands. And by that, I mean that this church is filled with teaching, and it's filled with great preaching, and it's filled with great groups and great studies, but nobody to actually go and put into practice all of these things that Jesus teaches us in his word. How functional would that church be in its mission? Or maybe the other way around, a church that has hands but, but no tongue. A church that has great programs, has a lot going on. They do a ton of things for the community. They're always serving people. But every time they do, they just fall short of being able to share with people the good news of Christ. Or they don't know how to convey the gospel clearly and actually make an eternal difference in their lives. Because nobody there is gifted in teaching. How functional will that church actually be? You see, the church is a body. It's made up of many parts. And all of them have an essential function, you included. Some are included, or some are equipped with a gift of service. Some are equipped with a gift of teaching. Some with a gift of encouragement. Some with a gift of mercy. And all of them belong together. And all of them are essential for this body to be healthy. And this is usually the place in the sermon where I, as your lead minister, would stand up here and say, and that's why everybody needs to volunteer and join a ministry team. Sign-up sheets are in the back. we got children's ministry, we got youth ministry, we got guest services, and I've done that before. Oftentimes to very disappointing results because those invitations are very easy to ignore. So instead of just pleading with you to volunteer, I thought that I might just open up my life a little bit and share with you exactly why it is crucial that each of us use the gifts that God has equipped us with. As I said before, I'm a father. I have two young boys. And my boys are going to grow up in a world where their faith and their beliefs are not going to be in the mainstream. And my boys will have to face a choice of compromise or ridicule, much to the extent that you and I have not had to deal with. That's just the direction that our culture is going. I think we can all see that. I can teach my boys the Bible. I can teach them the truth. I can teach them to give a reason for the faith that they profess. I can do that on my own. I, I really don't need the rest of the church for that because that's my gift. That's why I'm on earth. But what I do need is a group of people that will encourage my boys, that will support them, that whatever happens out there, when they come in these doors, there will be a community of people here that cares about them and spurs them on to faithfulness and that prays for them. That's what I need. Not I, your minister. I, their dad. 
Because I can't do those things by myself. I need the body. I need you, the church, in a very personal way. I have a wife. And someday, I'm going to die. I'm not in a hurry. You know, nothing's wrong, but it's going to happen someday. Truth be told, I don't take very good care of myself, so I will probably precede her. And I can teach my wife the truth of, of the resurrection and, and establish in her a firm faith and hope of, of eternal life. I don't need the rest of the church to do that. That's my gift. That's what I do. What I need is for somebody to stand next to her at my funeral. And what I need is for somebody to just sit and cry with her and pray with her and encourage her. And when she comes to worship on Sunday morning, say, you come sit with me. Because I can't do those things. I, not your lead minister, I, her husband, have a very personal need for the body. For those who have a gift of encouragement. For those who have a gift of hospitality. For those who have a gift of mercy. For those who have a gift for teaching and working with kids. For those who have a gift and a passion for loving on God's people. I have a deep personal need for a healthy church family. Do I want us all to participate in ministry teams and volunteer and serve here? Yes. Without exception, my goal and my prayer is 100% engagement across our church body, but not because I want to staff our programs or do fun events. It's because I'm not the only one who has kids being raised in this crazy, messed up world. I'm not the only one whose family is going to face difficult and challenging times. And I'm not the only one who is going to need somebody to come alongside my loved ones and pray for them and encourage them and care for them. Everybody has a need for the body. You follow me? This is not something that just benefits me or programs or our ministries. This is something that benefits the whole body because we don't just belong together, we belong to each other as the body. And we don't just come and sit in a building on Sunday morning and call ourselves the church. We've been equipped to serve and to build each other up and to, and to love on one another and help one another and to spur one another on. That's what it means to be the church. That's how a body functions. But when we treat church as a destination a place that we come to or an event that we attend, we miss out on all of that opportunity. If we want to stop going to church and be the church, it means being the body. It means being that person God created you to be, using the gifts he's equipped you and me to use to build one another and each other up. So don't go to church. Be the church. And as we've seen this morning, that means belonging, and that means service. And I want to challenge you to prayerfully consider how you will put that into action this year. For some of us, maybe that means making FCC the place where we want to belong. This will be our body. For some of us, maybe that means I will serve. This is the body I want to use my abilities and my gifts to pour into and to build other people up. And if that's your decision and your choice that God's calling you to, you can use the connection card on the back of the seat in front of you. We've got that FCC app. I've clicked the Sunday button. There's a way that says take a step. You can serve. But I want to implore you, don't walk out of here today having gone to church. Consider what God is calling you to, how he's equipped you, and be used by him for the purpose he created you to build up the people around you in his name. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for including us in the body. Sometimes it's confusing, uh, just trying to discern where we fit, but we are assured that we do fit and we do belong. Sometimes it's intimidating to think that you might use us in some way, but we are assured in Scripture you intend to use us. In fact, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We read that in the book of Ephesians. Lord, we praise you for your wisdom, for equipping us, for calling us, for empowering us, for saving us. And Lord, we ask that you would work through us, your people, your children, your church, to somehow be influential in the salvation of others. 
Maybe we encourage others, we invite others, we teach others. Maybe we just, through our, our acts of mercy and kindness, others will, will grow curious about who you are and who this God is. Lord, we don't know your plans, but we do know your calling, and it's to use us. And so, Father, here we are. Use us as your church. Amen.